morning, everybody. This is Rick Chafee with Ask the Masters. We are going to do a quick Paycheck Protection Program loan forgiveness update because we did one a couple weeks ago. We finally got the actual application now from the SBA. I have brought back in Diane McCauley. She is my CPA for my companies, but she has been super helpful and have dug into the system and, and really understands what's going on. We are going to also provide as a link in the, in the description another updated worksheet that we can use to help you fill out these forms. But the, the key thing here is to go over the major changes and some of the, and some of the calculations we have to do to make sure you're getting proper forgiveness. So without any further ado, I want to bring in Diane McCauley and welcome her to Ask the Masters again. She's been super helpful. Good morning. Let's go straight to it. Hi, Rick. Thanks for having me back. Um, it, it was really nice when we finally got some of the clarification we've been looking for on Friday when they actually uh, gave us the clarification via the uh, the, paycheck, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program Loan Forgiveness application. So like Rick said, this is going to be a, a quick update on some of the things that we've learned and some of the clarification that we have. Again, this uh, is done and being recorded on May 21st. This is our interpretation. This isn't meant to be given uh, individual advice. And we do recommend that you do check with your individual uh, CPAs or advisors. Having said that, let me get into some of the key items that were clarified in these instructions. Um, and again, one of the big things that we were waiting for was the terminology of the incurred and paid language that was in the uh, section 1106 of the CARES Act. And we now know what that means. Um, and it's very favorable. Most of the clarification and the instructions were very favorable to the borrower. It, there, there's one exception in that, but, and we'll go through that really quick in a minute. But I do want to talk about the paid and incurred because that's a big section of what was clarified. Okay. Basically, yeah, let's get into that. yeah I want to I want to talk about the two for the two top items kind of combined because one of the things that they also allowed us to do is they gave us an alternative payroll covered period that we can use, which will, we really want to make sure we're picking the right period. Now this new alternative payroll covered period allows the borrower to choose if they want to wait and have their covered period for only payroll costs be the eight week period starting with the first day of the payroll after they were funded. So for example, if you were funded on April 10th, but you didn't have a payroll start until the 13th, you could have your, um, your alternative payroll period start on the 13th and go for eight weeks at that point. But it may, be, it may not be beneficial for you to do that way. And let me give you an example. If, for example, you actually were funded again on the 10th, but you actually had a payroll that you ran on the 10th for a prior period, under the new guidance, because you paid that, under the coverage period, you would also get to count that. Whereas before we thought that it would have to be both paid and incurred. So you really want to be careful if you're choosing for administrative ease so you can actually have a very nice and clean, um, you know, eight week period and all in the same pay period. Be careful that you're not shooting yourself in the foot if you need that extra pay payroll to actually meet your fund test. So the one thing I would tell you to do is kind of run it both ways Look what your covered period would be if it's, a, if it's a specific starting on the day that you actually were funded versus what your alternative pay period would be and make sure you're making, you're making the right choice on that. It, keep in mind, I want to point out one other clarification. When we're talking about the alternative payroll covered period, it only refers to payroll items. And when we say payroll items, it, it, it's anything related to the payroll, such as the health insurance, you know, the uh, benefits. It doesn't include the rent and other non-payroll items. You have to stick with the actual covered period, which is from the day you're funded exactly 56 days or eight weeks. So you want to be really careful that, that if you do pick an alternative period, it is strictly for the payroll. Right. Um, so I do want to talk also just, letting people, so to break it down, to make it simplified a little bit, essentially, you can you can run your scenario the easy way, which might be the alternative meaning you wait until your first payroll period so the, so the numbers line up easily and your payroll reports match everything in the event that, that you don't meet all the guidelines or that you're not getting maximum um, forgiveness, you also want to run the scenario, obviously administratively, the more difficult way of 
we got paid on the 10th, let's start on the 10th and see how that works for us because you might find a more beneficial forgiveness. So, so take the time to work through both scenarios, even though one of them is gonna be a lot more labor intensive on the numbers to try to break through a couple of different payroll periods. It'll still, if you're, if you're not getting full forgiveness, it might get you a substantial forgiveness, especially in a larger company. On a smaller company, it might only mean a few thousand dollars. On a larger firm, it could mean you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, with this new guidance, we were able to get out of the woods on a lot of the companies where we were needing that little bit of extra funding because um, we had more money because they weren't hitting the 25% with non-payroll costs. So being able to include that extra payroll um, really is going to save a lot of them. And I think kind of that was the intent on a lot of these instructions because everything seemed to be so favorable. It's as if they're almost saying here, we will do whatever we can to make sure that that you get that, that you do qualify and all your funds get forgiven. Um, having said that, you do want to be careful um, just to make sure that you do take the time and run the numbers that you do pick what is the most beneficial for you. Right. I do want to point out that one of the things uh, along the same uh, along these same lines with as far as the rent for let me just use another example sure. as if you were funded on April 10th. Um, Again, the paid in incurred, if you, if you were funded on April 10th and you hadn't paid April's rent yet and you paid it on the 10th, you could conceivably pay April's rent and May's rent and June's rent because you're, you can pay June. You're, if you were funded on the 10th, you would be, your 56 days would be roughly June 3rd or 4th. I haven't done the math, but then you basically could pay all those three months rent. So you, there's nothing in there that says it has to be, you can't, if June's rent is due on the 1st and you pay it on the 1st, even though you end on the 3rd, there's nothing in the language of the instructions that says you can't count that entire amount. Awesome. So that's really a favorable, yeah, very, very favorable in, in that regard. Um, I do want to make one other comment and, and you couldn't, one of the things you want to start looking at is, finding out where you're going to be short. For example, one of the, not, one of the payroll costs that you can do is your um, employer match. And so most of us are going to be through six, all of us are going to be through at least six months. So if you have six months worth of employer match, you can reach in and pay that prior to June 3rd or prior to your ending date. And that all will count toward that payroll cost as well. So there's really a lot of, um, a lot of leeway and a lot of abil ability if you just take the time and find out um, where your numbers are and, and, and make sure that, that you're tracking. And you're referring to employee match like the 401k employee match. If, you're ma if you've got some of that banked that you haven't necessarily matched yet, you can put it in this period. Absolutely. A another One of the things that I found, one interesting situation, we had an, a, a client who had not yet paid their 2019 match. Mm -hmm. And it was a significant amount, a larger client, because they hadn't filed their corporate return. We paid that 2019 amount during the uh, covered period, and it will all be allowed. Awesome. Um, as of right now, there's no language that will not allow that. Yeah. Okay. Why we're talking about that, Rick, I kind of want to tie in one of, the, one of the key disappointments, if you will, that came in the instructions were, you know, we were all, we were all guessing whether or not there was nothing in the language that said we couldn't give raises or we couldn't give increases. But they did come in and said that if you are an owner employee, you are limited to uh, your 2019 compensation divided by 52 times eight. So basically eight works of whatever you worth of whatever you paid yourself in 2019. Now for a lot of single owner companies, S corps, uh, this is going to be problematic simply because, you know, they're going to have 25% that they're not going to probably be able to spend because they're going to be limited to basically whatever they were compensated. So that's where you're going to have to look into, okay, hey, we have, you know, a, a, a 401k plan. Let's pay our employer match on that all six months of it right now. Um, let's get that paid. Let's, um, you know, look into some of the other things that you might be able to pay. Is is rent a thing? Do we have vehicle gas? So that's where you're going to start needing to to really figure that out. Worst case scenario on those single owner, or even if that becomes a factor for you, the smaller the company, the bigger the factor, obviously. You're sure. just going to realize that it's okay. We may have to pay some of it back at 1%, not the end of the world. Correct. But that is one of the disappointing things that we found out. Okay. But it still looks like they left a lot of flexibility with like adding transportation as a recoverable, which means it can be 
whenever you're using transportation could have been flights could have been fuel could have so you you've got a lot of if you're if you're paying attention early enough you can make sure to accumulate this properly and use any re any reasonable expense that is properly categorized and allowed through the PPP program so don't it take now is why you need to know where you're going to fall in so that you don't lose that opportunity yeah, if, if we learned anything on this, it's planning is going to be key and just know where you're going to land so you, you have plenty of time to make up yeah. um, any shortfalls, okay? And there is nothing to say, there is nothing to say that you can't hire somebody else. If you are someone who needs to some jobs done that you've been putting off, now would be a really super good time to get those uh, new employees in there and, uh, and and get that work done. So don't think that just because oh, I can't pay myself, that game over. No, that's not true. So make sure that you're, you're um, you know, trying to think about all the things that you can do that would fit within that forgiveness so you don't have to give the money back. Right, and I mean, the main, the main goal of this whole process was not to give your company money. It was to give your company money that you get into the hands of every single employee so that they don't feel the impact of COVID, which allows them to keep the economy moving and keep them healthy and home and in their house, et cetera. So the... There, there's nothing wrong with adding and doing some extra work that needs to be done and just get it done now. Don't put it off, get it done now because those funds are going to be able to go into the hands of the people that are, it's supposed to correctly. Absolutely. It just doesn't have to be the same guy. So yes, that's yeah. absolutely. We want to make sure we get that done. Okay. Um, the next thing I want to kind of talk about that we've all wondered about was the FTE calculation. Now we were all assuming pretty much as a profession, just based on where this fell into the code section, that it was going to be a 30 hour work week, but it's 40. Um, if you set up any of the tables that we kind of gave as examples, it's very easy to go in and switch that from a 30 to a 40. One of the things in all of our testing that we have found is it's really not impacting because you're changing it to a, a 40 for the look back period as well as the coverage period. So really that's not going to be a big impact, but what is really going to be beneficial for some people and is they, they have given us a simplified method that assigns, sim, it's very simple, 40 hours or more per week is a one, anything less than that is a 0.5. So where that's gonna be beneficial, if you have a smaller company, you're struggling on FTEs, and you hire some very quick, if you will, uh, part-time people, if they even work for you know an hour during the coverage period, they get a 0.5. So it really shouldn't be hard to meet your FTEs if, if, you, if you just put a little bit of effort into it. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about with FTEs, uh, one of the things we're not going to do in this meeting is go into the deep mechanics of, of a lot of this. I will share with you the updated spreadsheet, but I want to mention um, one of the things that we, we were doing some testing on a very small company and a lot of the people wouldn't come back. And so one of the things they did for us in these instructions is on the FTE, they gave us a really nice Hail Mary. And basically they're allowing, there's four exceptions. You know, they originally in FAQ number 40 only, only really mentioned one. And that was that if you make an employee a good faith written offer to rehire them and it's rejected, that wouldn't count against you. So in the instructions okay. and, and in the uh, application, it allows you to remove that FTE. Well, in the instructions for the application, they've given us three more. So in addition to the, if you make an employee a good faith, faith offer, and, and they reject it. You can also, if you fire them for cause, I actually got an email this morning that says they just really need to fire someone during this COVID, during this covered period, but they were concerned, but they did come out on Friday and say that if you fire them from cause, they will not count against you. Now, I will say that the instructions aren't super great on the mechanics of this. I do personally believe they're gonna come up with some tweaking because there's a, there's a little bit of ambiguity, which is not surprising. But the third thing, the third um, exception, if you will, is an employee request and receives a reduction of hours. I'm sure we've all had this. Someone needs to stay home a little more with their kids, or or they have they they feel like they're exposed and they and they have a high, you know, probability yes, of sure. getting sick. Yeah. Then then we don't we we want to make sure that that's not going to count against us. And the last one is if the employee voluntarily terminates employee, employment, that's not going to count against us either. So really, I, I can't see a scenario where if you're not just a little bit, uh, you know, 
forward thinking that you can't get your FTEs up because that's really, really for which are so many of our circumstances. And even if then, if even with all that, you can't meet it, the safe harbor, there's still a safe harbor that says if the borrower restores its FTE as of June 30th, so literally as of June 30th to the FTE level for the pay period that included February 15th of 2020, there will be no reduction in FTE. So if nothing else, make sure on June 30th, you have the required FTEs. If you just, you know, do whatever you've got to do. I do want to show um, just real quick. One, before you get into um, the, before you get into showing yes. the, the critical thing that yes. I, you keep pointing out, I want to make sure nobody misses on. You have to figure this out now because you can't wait till June and go, oh, we need two more employees in April, right? So or May for that matter. So. Yes. The reason you have to get involved in your FTE equation right now and figure out what your forgiveness level is going to be is because you have to make the corrections now. There's easy corrections so that you can make sure you get proper forgiveness, but they can't be backtracked easily because they won't be in your payroll report. So you obviously be, be creating fraud, which nobody wants to do in the first place. But the point is you can't make up this problem or you can't fix the problem after the fact. You have to get into it that now and make the changes now so that at the end of the qualifying period, things are correct. That's well stated. I, I appreciate that. Yes, that is absolutely, absolutely on all of this. You really need to get ahead of it. And the application itself isn't difficult if you're doing all of the record keeping ahead of time and knowing where you are. Um, so having said that, I just want to kind of show you, we've updated a little bit. If any of you remember the table that we shared last time, this is our average FTE calculations. And again, this is the test one is just a look back period from February through June 30th. And again, we're, we're going through and assigning all the FTEs. What we've done in this updated version is we've moved all the data to one tab um, just so we can easily calculate the FTEs. And I'm going to show you the covered tab because one of the things you have to do in the application is actually say what your FTE per person is. You have to calculate that. So in this example, we have the, the first person here and we have one, their one FTE because it's, this is a biweekly payroll. So we have one uh, FTE for each period because she was full time, so that's four. Now at the end of the covered period, we will simply divide this by the number of periods and that will give us the average FTE for them. So it'll be very easy to, to, to get that data as soon as we're done. But in the meantime, what this allows us to do is see how we're trending. We know again from test two that this is the lowest FTE period. So we are well within our FTE. So we know because during our covered period so far, we're averaging 21.2 and our test is only 14.7, we're going to easily meet that FTE. So we have really no concerns on that. So again, this, this, the instructions allowed us to kind of know a little better of the methodology that we're going to need. So one of the things we also learned about the application is we're not submitting the raw data. We are submitting basically the simply the app, actually the application. And I don't believe the worksheet is um, it's just basically schedule A and the app and the actual form, but not the worksheet. So we do need to maintain that data and it need, we are going to attest that it's, we have done it and it does pass the test. So yeah, having only, said that, keep going caveat, on that now. Yeah, the only caveat on that is the companies that have brought in more than $2 million, those companies are actually going to get audited and have to turn in all their paperwork from day one. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. And we didn't touch on that. There, There is a the, one of the FAQs that did come down, you know, basically gave a uh, safe harbor for anybody who, a safe harbor in the are, is it necessary for you? The answer would be yes if it's less than two million. Anybody over two million, get your documents ready. You're you're going to get audited, and they are going to go through this with a fine tooth comb. So yes, that that this this is not meant for that. Right. So it. Um, so the good thing is you do all this paperwork, have all your calculations, keep it in your tax records just like you would any other time. Turn in the proper paperwork from the application. They obviously are allowed to audit you in case there's a question, but you aren't required to turn in that paperwork, certainly go through it, unless you're a company that received more than $2 million. Mm -hmm. At that point, you are in a totally different situation. They're gonna have a lot more 
oversight into the fact that you need to meet all the qualifications. So that's the, that's the big trigger. There was a lot of fear, I think, publicized when the $2 million mark came out or then it came out and said they were going to check everybody. Everybody's got to get audited for this. That's not the case. It's only happening when you are a $2 million when you've received over $2 million, now they're going to do that to you. So most companies as intended will fall with under that $2 million range and the safe harbor is easily met. Yeah. The, yeah. That's not to say that they don't have the right to come back and look at anybody. Um, but sure. yes, absolutely. Um, I want to talk about one other thing that was clarified in the instructions that is a huge relief for, for me and a lot of our calculations that we're doing, and that's the hourly salary wage reduction. What they basically did when, when we originally um, received this based on just based on the, the lack of language, if you will, in the original uh, loan application, it says that you're that basically you're during the coverage period, it ha you can you can't have a more than 25% uh, reduction in your salary, but they really didn't tell us what that meant. Was that actually dollars? And at first we thought, okay, if we take um, the look back period, which was, you know, January through March, can we divide that by the number of hours or whatever? There really wasn't any guidance. Now we know that it's actually a um, salary. So your salary can't actually reduce. So if you reduce hours, you actually go back and calculate it based on if it's hourly, the number of hours you work. So for example, if you worked in the covered period, excuse me, January through March, and you worked, you know, a thousand hours, which probably isn't possible. It's based on your hourly rate. So as long as your hourly rate didn't drop, even though the amount you were paid because you worked a significant amount less, that's not going to come back. You literally calculate your hourly rate, uh, your hourly rate, your average hourly rate during that time and compare that to your hourly rate during the covered time. So even though the dollars may have gone down, as long as your rate was the same, there is no reduction. Uh, awesome. for that. And same thing with salary. You just calculate it. You annualize it. So if you're on salary and you were paid for the first quarter, you would just times that by four. That would give you your your annualized salary. You would take your annualized salary during the eight-week period. As long as your annualized salary didn't go down, there's no wage reduction. So that is a very generous, generous interpretation of that, which is really going to help a lot of our testing as well. Okay. As well, you got the other piece of uh, clarification with um, rent obligations being able to include both real property and personal property. So yeah, that was a uh, question, and so that was clarified. Okay. Yeah. Well, it does. I've, I've read through it multiple times. It's a little bit daunting for sure. Um, it, if you if you slow down, read through it carefully, fill out the pa fill out the paperwork and the and the the uh, worksheets, it does come together pretty easily. I think everybody should know we are going to up. We're going to include a newer updated version of the worksheet that Diane put together for us. So you can use that to put in all your paperwork. you will be able to use that as a backup for how you came to your numbers. Um, and it might help you kind of clarify some of the worksheet issues. So that will be included in the show notes so you can get that and help you fill out your application. But as Diane pointed out earlier, we are not trying to give you specific accounting or legal device. So any company that has any questions, concerns should certainly reach out to their, their own private CPAs or anybody else that does their accounting systems or their attorneys to make sure that their ducks are in a row and make sure that this is properly forgiven. So this is just as a tool to help you get to that point. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, I appreciate that. I will make just one. If you're going to start working on your application, start backwards, start working on the worksheets because it goes backwards and fails forward. So, um, everybody should start gathering their data, uh, become really good friends with an Excel expert if you're not, and uh, good luck. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, Diane, you've been a super helpful. Um, we might do another one of these depending on if we get further guidance that seems specific or, or uh, dynamic to what we've already put out there. Um, if it's just simple stuff, we'll do an update on our Facebook page and our YouTube channels. But um, I wanna thank you again, Diane McCauley, for coming on with us. It is May 21st of 2020. This is Rick Chafee with Ask the Masters. If you uh, make sure you like and subscribe to our YouTube page, that'll be very helpful for you to know when we put these updates out because the updates like this come out in a more random fashion because they're so timely. So um, if there's anything else you need us to get clarification on, you can always comment in the show notes or comment on our Facebook page and we'll try to source that information for you and get you a uh, the best answer we can as educated as best we can be. So is there anything else you want to cover for us, Diane? 
That's it. Um, but thanks again for having me, Rick. I appreciate the chance to update our previous information. Yep, you've been an awesome help. Thank you very much. Thank you.